Joshua chapter 1, that's good, verse 6 and 7. You ready? I said, are you ready for the word of God? Yeah. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Be thou strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Let the church say, Amen. And then in the book of Ephesians, the New Testament equivalent of the book of Joshua, a book of warfare in the New Testament. If you're a wimp, don't read Ephesians and don't read Joshua. It is not for wimps. It is for warring people. Verse 10, read together. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Tonight, brothers and sisters, women and children, boys and girls, I want to share with you from the topic, are you positioned for the promise? Put it on the screen, do you have it? Are you positioned for the promise? Could you just say that to somebody and ask them tonight, are you positioned for the promise? Father, I thank you now for this time and I bless you for your wonderful care for your people. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba, Father. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. So right now, God, I pray that you will quicken your people to the reality of a promise, of a possession, even of a land that flows with milk and honey, a place of prosperity, a place of peace, but also a place where there's spiritual warfare. But I thank you that you've encouraged us to be strong and of a good courage, that you'll be with us wherever we go. If we'll put the word first and hide it in our hearts, seek you first. You've got our back. Thank you for being our re-rewarder. Thank you for being our helper and our friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Put your hands together for the word of the Lord. <laughs> Being positioned is a critical part of receiving what it is that God has for you. I'm going to say this so you can understand me very clearly tonight. Being positioned is a critical part of receiving what it is that God has in store for you. If you read the book of Habakkuk, you'll find out that he said, I will set myself upon the watch to see what the Lord will say to me, whether he'll reprove me, incur whatever he wants to do, I just need to position myself so that God can speak to me or that God can deal with me. He said to Jehoshaphat, go down into the valley. There's a place that I want you to go. There's a place you need to be in able or in order for you to receive the deliverance that I have prescribed for you. Go down. Being in the right place at the right time is very powerful. There's nothing like it. I'm talking about literally aligning yourself. It's so critical that you're in the right place at the right time. When God has given you a promise, you need to be in the right place at the right time. That's why sometimes you've got to get off a death row. Let me say it over here. That's why sometimes you have to get off of death row. What, what I mean by that, if you look down your row right now, if there's somebody who looks dead, if there's somebody, when you come into a church and they're not praising and, 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 and they're not lifting their hands to God and they're not expressing their appreciation for God's care for them, there's some people who sit on the same side of the church in the same seat all the time and then they wonder why nothing's happening in their life. But every now and then you need to look down your row and see who's on your row because you may be sitting on death row. So sometimes you have to get off of death row. So if you want what God has promised, you've got to learn how to stay in line until they call your number. Let me explain that. I, I was in a waiting room one time for four hours at a phone company or something waiting, 
and, and I got up demanding somebody to tell me why nobody has seen me yet. I was a little upset, controlled anger. I was just expressing myself. And I wanted to break the line, and I wanted to skip. I started looking, I saw this little old lady, and I was saying, man, she ain't gonna say nothing. I'm too big for her, I just jump in front of her. But I didn't skip, I couldn't skip, because my problem was I didn't take a number when I came in. So they didn't call my number because I didn't have one. So I need you to tell somebody, no skipping, just take a number and be patient. How many of you have a number from God, have a promise from God, have something that you believe God wants to do? How many of you are in line right now for a blessing, in line right now for a miracle? Well, just take your number and wait because after a while, he's going to call your name. After a while, you're going to get closer and you're going to get closer until he calls your name. So both of the books that I read out of Joshua chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 6 uh, are strategic. And they're very similar, as I said. They both deal strategically with positioning. They are both combat books. They're both books on warfare. And if you're not into fighting for what's yours, then don't read them. Because both of these books are for warring saints. I wonder if I got any warring saints in here. They're also for embattled and endangered saints. Those who are the target of the enemy. See, a lot of people, I'm so anointed, I'm so anointed, I'm so anointed. Your anointing gives you power to loose all that oppressed of the devil, all right. But your anointing also makes you a bullseye. When the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon the Lord Jesus in the form of a dove, the Bible said, the heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then straightway he was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit and tempted 40 days and 40 nights of the devil because the devil now knew who he was. He was the anointed one, the Messiah. The anointing targeted him and made him a target for the enemy. How many of you can remember when you got anointed, when the power of God really came on your life and all hell broke loose? How many of y'all can remember when you didn't have any problems at all, when you were just a weak little wimpish little Christian just going to church, you didn't know anything about demons and principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. It wasn't until your eyes came open, you were baptized in the Holy Ghost, you were filled with the Spirit of the living God, and all of a sudden now, you start seeing demons behind every corner. All of a sudden now, you started being harassed, couldn't sleep at night. You were up binding and loosing and doing all kinds of things y'all not helping me here that you never thought you would do some of y'all looking at me like you're crazy but keep living evidently you ain't in with warfare because we fight a serious fight and it's not against flesh and blood but it's against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness and high places man the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and the casting down of imaginations and bringing every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God into the captivity and the obedience of Jesus Christ. There's a war going on. It's in our mind. It's trying to mess with us. It's trying to get us to turn around, to walk away from God, to act a fool, to ruin our testimony. But we got to resist that thing. We got to fight that thing. You may not ever manifest it because you're fighting that thing and resisting that thing in your mind and in your spirit. So these are books of warfare. They're just some books in the Bible that are for fighting saints and saints that are in conflict. Some things just seem to be reserved for folk who realize that you get nothing from God without a fight. Everything you get from God is with a struggle. This message is for folk who've been through some stuff and are going through some stuff right now to get some stuff promised to you for later. There's some things you got to go through to get to what God has promised you. Now notice the process to possessing your promise. When God delivered Israel from Egypt, the Bible says that they were delivered, delivered it first of all into a desert now if you don't know what a desert is you ought to know what a desert is around here because y'all have some droughts around here <laughs> it's desert desert is simply a barren trek of land that is incapable of sustaining human life 
It is a barren tract of land that is incapable of sustaining human life. There's no water there. There's no life there. There's no flowers there. There's no bloom there. There's nothing producing there. Secondly, when they made it out of the wilderness, you thought that was enough. They crossed over the Jordan and they were delivered now into a promised land, right? God had promised them. They get through the wilderness. They cross the Jordan and bam, right smack in the midst of seven nations greater than they were and mightier than they were and these folk were in possession of the stuff that God said was theirs. I'm preaching. Y'all looking at me, but I'm preaching. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. I'm going to read it to you. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and have cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Gergesites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Parasites and the Havites and the Jebusites and the Termites and the Shilites, <laughs> and seven nations, he said, greater and mightier than you greater and mightier than thou. He said, so these are the people that are in the land. Notice the pattern. Notice the pattern. Moses led them. They followed. Thank you. And God did the work. That's the pattern. You can take those scriptures out. Joshua led them. They followed. And God did the work. So my friends, this is a secret to success. It's a repeated pattern. Leaders lead, followers follow, and God does the work. Amen. Amen. Thank you right there. Thank you. Thank you. That's money. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Somebody's got to lead and somebody has got to follow. We've got to know how to follow. We want all this wonderful fellowship, and this is great fellowship. But the real key to victory is not fellowship. You can fellowship for all the wrong reasons and for all kinds of reasons, but fellowship is your ability to follow that's going to make the difference, that's going to get you to where you've got to go. When you follow, you've got to see this, when you follow the leadership that God has placed in your life, you will possess what God has promised you. Somebody's got to lead and somebody's got to follow. So in Joshua 3, they were told also to keep their distance between themselves and the priests who carried the ark. And we got to know how to keep our distance and watch this, not get too familiar with our leaders. The leaders have got to learn how to protect the anointing on their life. We can't get too common with folk because familiarity breeds contempt. And the reverence that you need to have and that you need to always have for your spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers, and for your leaders ought to be one. I don't care if you go fishing every day. I don't care if you go and bungee jump at the Victoria Falls. I don't care what you do together. That will always be your spiritual father and always be your leader. And it will always be pastor. And it will always be honored. And don't get too familiar. Now, some of y'all pastors ought to be saying amen or something. Because you need to learn how to keep your distance and honor. The Bible said know them that have ruled over you and over you in the Lord and esteem them highly in love for their work's sake. That is to know them. The term there is to, to know, but it is from a distance to allow them to be in their place and you to accept the fact that they didn't get there by hook or crook. Accept the fact that God raises one up and takes another one down. Respect the fact that if somebody has gotten into a position of leadership and they've been magnetic enough to draw you to them and for you to follow them, then you need to realize that God God is in it. So keep your distance. And by the way, how many of y'all know people in the church that just can't see the vision and just don't understand nothing? In some churches, not this church, let's say some churches, you know some people like that. I just don't see it. Why we got to do that? I just don't understand why we got to do that. Can I help y'all with this? All you pastors need to learn this. The one-eyed man is king in the kingdom of the blind. And when you can't see it and you don't understand it, it says nothing about the vision. It says something about you. It says you're ignorant and blind. And please don't tell everybody. But if you can't see it and don't understand it, find you somebody that can see it, even if it's a little bit. Because if all of us were standing at Victoria Falls and we were all blind, all of you were blind, and I can see a little bit out of my left eye, how many of y'all would vote for me to be the king and the leader? How many of y'all be like, where we at now? Where we at now? 
Where, 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 where we at now, Pastor? Where we at now? All you want to know is that somebody can see it a little bit because this journey is so uncertain and there's so many pitfalls and there's so many temptations and there's so many struggles. So you need to find somebody that has a vision so that you can fulfill the promise and possess what God has for you. So I told you that Joshua and Ephesians are similar. So in Ephesians 6, Paul writes and talks about the warfare, and he gives it a spiritual twist. In Joshua, it's natural. Seven enemies, mighty, greater than you. In the spirit, it's principalities and powers. So this time, it's not the Hittites and the Havites and, and the otherites. This time, it's spiritual warfare. The devil and his lies, false doctrine, and deception. We have to fight and war to defeat the voices of doubt and fear, doubt and unbelief. That's why they didn't enter in to possess the land. They didn't enter in because of doubt and unbelief. These voices will guarantee you not receiving what God has promised if you listen to doubt and unbelief. My friends, let me help you. The enemy is after your faith. The enemy wants you to fear your possibility and to doubt your potential. So he comes with doubt and unbelief. We have to learn how to listen to God. The devil is a liar. The last thing he told you was a lie. The next thing he'll tell you is a lie. So whenever the enemy has ever spoken to you and said, you can't, you won't, and don't, you ought to say, thank you, I will, I shall, and it's mine. Because the devil is a liar. He cannot tell the truth. He's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. You've got to get this in your spirit. So if the enemy's ever spoken to you and caused fear, do you need to understand, watch this, that fear has a voice. And fear is not the opposite of faith. I'm so tired of people saying it's just the opposite of faith. No, you need faith to have fear. Why? Because fear is faith in what the enemy says could happen and would happen if you believe God. So in order for fear to work in your life, you got to believe it. So fear is not the opposite of faith. You got to have faith to have fear. You got to believe that the enemy will do what he says he'll do. Y'all not helping me, but fear is real. And it's backed up by circumstances and jacked up situations and conditions. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. So as we walk by faith, we're encouraged to do something that no one is, is exempt from. The Bible says that we need to fight the good fight of faith. So when you read the book of Joshua, it's about to get good. It is simply recorded history of the people of God who lived before us, who came to know their God through the things that they had to fight in order to possess what they were promised. In other words, I want you to tell somebody, stop whining and learn the lesson. You don't get it. Somebody in here needs to go out and get some Hallmark cards. Y'all got Hallmark cards here? Greeting cards. You need to go out and get some greeting cards for your known and your sworn enemies because if you didn't have enemies and if it weren't for some of them knuckleheads that are messing with you, you wouldn't even know the Lord like you know him right now. Some of y'all are complaining about enemies and what people are doing to you. It wasn't until they started bothering you that you really started praising. It wasn't until they started messing with you. Come on, y'all. You got haters. How many y'all got some haters out there? Haters. Y'all know what haters are over here? You need to turn your hater into an elevator. You need to learn how to go higher and take that thing to the next level. Can I get 10 people to shout glory? Uh, Y'all a little slow, but we're going to get there in a minute here. So now I've come all the way from Jacksonville, Florida to let somebody know that there are battles that you face that are simply designed to help develop your relationship with God. 
when, when, when they, the people of God in, in, in the wilderness, embraced the struggle, uh, then they could embrace their promise. When you realize it won't be easy, you'll be on your way to transforming even your nation. If you know that it requires a fight and if you're willing to fight. So I've come to help you tonight. I've come to help you. God loves y'all and he has a wonderful plan for your life. So then the question is, what you gonna do? When you get your breakthrough and you finally embrace your promise, what you going to do when you're holding that child that you've been believing God for, when you're working that job that you've been waiting to get the call for, you living in that house that you've been driving by every day looking at naming it and claiming it, what you going to do when you're walking down the aisle with your boo and he's making eyes at you and you dressed up in your pretty gown? Pastors, what are you going to do when you get into your new facility, expand your buildings, add that educational wing, lift the roof, add those extra seats because you need them? in the auditorium. What you gonna do when the money is in the bank and when the crazy folk are clothed and in their right mind? What you gonna do when your children get saved, when your mother and your father come to know the Lord Jesus Christ? What you gonna do when crime goes down in Harare and drugs are coming off the street? What are you gonna do when prostitutes start leading songs in the choir, when ex-pimps and pushers start coming to the house of God? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when God starts giving you that thing that you've been waiting for, that you've been hoping for, that you've been praying for. I tell you what, if you believe that God's going to do it, let me tell you something about God's promises. The promises of God are in him, yea and amen. If God made you the promise, it's just as like you've got the answer already. So what you going to do when it comes? It ought to be what you're going to do right now. Do it right now. Shout right now. You don't have to wait till the battle is over. Shout right now. Right. So then, Joshua says, oh, we're going to shout in a minute. Be strong and of a good courage. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The word strong in Joshua and in Ephesians mean the same thing. This is really good. It literally means to become strong. It means to become secure. Secure. It means to take a stand. It literally means do not be moved. It means to settle in. It means stuff falling all around you. Things are happening after you've done all to stand. Stand. Stand, therefore. Look that thing right in the face. Subdue it. Don't be daunted or intimidated by it. Don't even consider the issue. Look at yourself and look at the problem. The problem is bigger than you, but the problem is not bigger than your God. You need to understand that God's your re-rewarder, that God's got your back. That when you show up to fight, now the Bible says all you got to do is show up to fight. Because David will tell you this, the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. So when you show up to fight and you talking about, man, I ran that devil away. I got him on the run. He wasn't running from you. God had your back. He, he saw who was with you and he realized he's no match for God. See, Michael, uh, uh, they're not bring a railing accusation against Satan and he's stronger in might than us. But he says, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Angels are made a little higher than us and, and, and stronger than us. And they don't even contend with some of the powers that we to talk about we contend with and some of y'all that are talking about the devil was at your house and the devil showed up to your house one night can I help can I help you with something that wasn't the devil if the devil ever came to your house you move out <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> I mean I'm just saying I mean if the devil himself ever showed up in your house you would never go back off up in there yeah now you have you have one of his little imps off up in there and, and and even when you know that you're in a spiritual warfare you can sleep at night because so many of you are not sleeping good at night because of the presence i believe it was uh one of the great preachers i don't know whether it was uh whitfield or whether it was uh, uh spurgeon or one of the guys but they were trying to sleep and while they were trying to sleep they kept sensing this eerie presence in the room I mean, it was dominating. It was, a, it was more than a shadow. It was tangible. It was real. 
and they could not sleep. I know some of y'all have experienced that. Could not sleep. There was something in that room. There was a bump in the night. And he couldn't sleep and couldn't get sleep. So he rolls over and he looks up and it's some demonic presence. So when he realizes what it is, he rolls over. He says, oh, it's just you. <laughs> and he rolls over and he goes to sleep. My friends, once you realize that you're in a battle and that there's spiritual powers and wickedness, that there are things that are coming to intimidate you and to cause fear, you can rest at night and sleep knowing that if God's hand is upon your life, that if he has a hedge about you, the enemy cannot touch you. Come here, Job. You want to have Job? Go ahead and give him your best shot. But Job is full of integrity. God will allow you to be tempted and tested in some areas just to prove to everybody and their mama that you ain't scared, that you you ain't going nowhere and if God let it happen to you he let it happen to you because he knew you can handle it because he will not allow you to be tempted above that you're able but with the temptation the test and the trial he'll make a means for you to escape that you might be able to bear it now if it went to your next door neighbor's house they'll be running down the street but how many of y'all ever been called to a situation where a family was going crazy and you had heard Pastor Tom and Pastor Bonnie preach and teach and talk about loosing and binding and you walked up off up in that house like you were Reinhardt Bunky or somebody. You walked up there and started saying, in the name of Jesus, everybody just get, every, come here. How many of y'all have taken your oil to a neighbor's house? Somebody said they're sick. You go in there like, like water. You go in there, oh, bam, and just lay hands on them. Y'all not helping me. I'm trying to get y'all to get out of these pews, out of these chairs, out of these four circle walls, and get out there and live like a Christian, act like a Christian, walk like a Christian, talk like a Christian, demonstrate the power of God on your job, in your neighborhood, everywhere you go. Sitting up in here waiting on me to holler and scream and throw a rod and waiting on somebody to sing for you, do something for you. You ought to be walking down the street just singing, I whistle while you work. <laughs> You ought to just be walking around here like them little seven dwarves, just happy, doofy, dummy, dopey, and just walking around here acting like you don't have a worry in the, in the world. Because don't worry for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds at peace through Christ Jesus. And whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are pure, and whatsoever things are honest, and anything that's got any kind of virtue, think on those things. God will change your mind. God will do something. And everything that you've both heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace will be with you. God will be with you. God is with you. I wish I had some people that knew God was with them. Come on. Come on. God is with you. He's with me. He's with me whithersoever I go with. I flew here on an airplane, and we hit some turbulence. I'm talking about like, <laughs> too much air. We hit some turbulence. <laughs> and I was like, Lord, I know you're with me. <laughs> So anyway, let me keep going because it speaks to the, the, the fact of, of strength. And strength then is a process. If you're going to look like Pastor Tom in his custom-made suits, then it's going to take some work. Look at Bonnie. You're just fine. He's fine, ain't he, Bonnie? You, you like that, don't you? Muscles and everything? Yeah. You raised up your boys like that, too. They got muscles. They ripped like their daddy. If you're going to build spiritual muscles, it takes time and process. We're living in the greatest hour of expectation in the history of the church. So we know this is an Elijah generation. We're turning the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to children, children to the fathers toward each other. But I've come to announce tonight that we shouldn't forget the Joshua generation. The Joshua generation is the breakthrough revelation, the breakthrough generation, a generation that's positioned to possess the promises of God. The people being raised up who will finally manifest the purposes of God are the Joshua generation. They'll finally possess what God has promised them, a people who won't give up, a people who didn't give up, a people who could have given up, but a people who said, I shall not 
be moved. A people who've been through hell and high water, but they're still here. You look at them and they don't look like what they've been through. You've got some people in here that are dressed up tonight. They're looking good, smell good, but I'm telling you, they done been through some stuff, but God is so great. His deliverance is so mighty that you can't even tell that they've been through what they've been through. They come down here and dance and leap and y'all see them and go, I wish I had that kind of faith. In order to get that kind of faith and to get that kind of praise you got to have that kind of trouble and you got to be willing to come through and to come out of that kind of trouble because your trials will develop your praise you're not a born worshiper you're born to worship it takes experience and some things for you to go through in order for you to really lift your hands like you need to lift your hands and really bow your knee and really kiss toward God like you need to you got to go through something in order to really master praise and worship and to have a shout in spite of what's going on in your life a lot of these kids that run down here they're homeless they don't have parents they're orphans they've got issues they got physical ailments in their body they're messed up and they all they have is their God and the worship of their God and some of you that roll your eyes out of them and talk about why don't they sit down and they're always running down there you ought to be ashamed of yourself it's just like some people right now are jumping up and somebody saying sit down you ought to be ashamed of yourself you don't know what those folk have been through. You don't know the hell that they've had in their life. You don't know what they had to go through just to get to this church tonight. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. If I jump up, I jump up because I know that God has been good to me. I ought to be dead. It should have been over, but God wouldn't let it be. So then, these folk that just get up, he's talking about, well, why they always got to run down there and put money? There's another one. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. They know exactly what it is that they're seeding for. They know exactly what they heard that motivated them and moved them to sow in this offering. So then, so then, so then, let me finish the message because we're going to shout in a minute. I've come to announce a Joshua generation. When I see these young people, when Daniel came to my house, and spent a week with me in Jacksonville, Florida. Daniel worshiped with us. I hosted the Gospel Heritage Conference of America. I had Donnie McClurkin and Hezekiah Walker and Vashon Mitchell and Judy Christian McAllister. And I had the who's who of gospel music there. And Daniel just in there taking pictures with them and in my office and showing them around, acting like it was his church. But one of the beautiful things about it was on Sunday morning, Bonnie, I don't know what happened. Power of God fell and everybody went to going crazy. And all of a sudden I was inundated on the stage with a whole bunch of youth all over the place, similar to what you guys do right here. But they were everywhere. And I looked behind me out the corner of my eye and there was Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he can sing, got a little music. He just danced white. He just ain't got no rhythm. I got rhythm. Uh, he, he, you know, but, but the joy that he had, 9,000 miles away from home, and he didn't need you. He wasn't in his safety zone. He wasn't in this environment. He was in a place of praise, and he was there, and he was thankful to God that he arrived alive, and he was praising God when you weren't looking. So don't think that people on the stage only praise when you're looking. There's some folk that'll praise God when you ain't nowhere around. There's some folk that'll praise God. God when ain't nobody messing with them. There's some folk that'll start running and ain't nobody chasing them. They'll start crying and ain't nothing hurting them. Y'all not helping me here. And I'm telling y'all how many y'all out there right now. People look at you on your job and say, you crazy. And you go, hallelujah. Glory to God. I thank God for saving me. All right. But here's the message. Here's the message. There's a people being raised up that are going to possess, but they got to position themselves to possess. Joshua generation is a warring generation, a generation that would charge the gates of hell and forcibly take back from the devil everything. A generation, the Joshua generation, a generation that would bring in the greatest harvest of souls in the shortest period of time that the world has ever seen. I keep hearing this talk about a nation born in a day. If you don't know what that picture looks like, it's like everything changing, like in Samaria overnight. 
It's like you coming in the next day and this godly government and people in position for when the righteous are in rule, the people rejoice. It's like coming in and all of a sudden there's a torrential rain and a downpour and the parched land and the barren land begins to sprout green. All of a sudden you walk down the street and people are greeting each other and smiling and things are happening and you're trying to figure out, am I in Harare or am I in Hawaii? And you don't know what in the world is going on. When your family members start calling you and start saying stuff like, hey, you know what? You were praying for me? Well, it worked. Last night I received Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. It looks this way when the economy begins to turn around and all of a sudden this high inflation just kind of deflates and all of a sudden you get back to your own monetary system and it's a system that's fair and just when you can go to a store and a petrol place and they haven't jacked up the prices and they haven't made you pay three four times more than what an item is actually worth but when a nation is born in the day it may not happen as it is but things begin to turn overnight and things will begin to happen in the days of Samaria. The prices flipped over and food was in abundance and things just started happening overnight at the word of the prophet of God. You've got to live every day in anticipation of a word, your word. See, the whole system doesn't need to turn around, but you can have a turnaround in your own life and you can have it even with a word from the Lord tonight because there's something God wants to say to you in closing that will position you to be able to possess what he's promised you. And I want you to know that I didn't come all the way from Jacksonville just to, I mean, I really do want you to get this down in your spirit. And I want every Gideon or everybody that's been hiding in fear of the enemy. I want everybody that's been afraid to really walk out on faith. I want everybody that's looked at their situation and their circumstance and say that you're too small or you're not bright enough or your family's too poor or you've got too many physical ailments or you've got mental issues of problems, I want you to know that you can live every day in expectation of a miracle and a turnaround in your life. If God can take me, a no good, good for nothing, low down, scum of the earth, backbiting, whoremongering sinner who had never read a Bible till he was 26 years old, had never been inside the doorways of a church, didn't believe that there was a God, had tried all this other stuff. If God can save me, I am guarantee you he can save anybody. And for me to be here in Zimbabwe preaching with my crazy self I'm telling you he can save and use anybody if we're going to possess the things we have to be properly positioned to receive them got to be sensitive then here's what you need to do according to the text four things are needed to position us number one you've got to serve somebody You've got to serve somebody. Who are you assisting? Who are you assigned to? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy now? <laughs> You've got to have a spiritual father, mentor, pastors in your life. Joshua 1.1 1, 1 says, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant. Moses was the Lord's servant. He was the first fruits. He was called to be the first shepherd. And the father fathered him and shepherded him. But he raised up a Joshua. And Joshua was the servant of Moses. Before Joshua could lead people, he had to serve people. Before Moses could lead, he had to serve. He served Jephthah, his father. There's so many people who want to lead, but they don't want to serve. There's so many people who want a title, but they don't want a towel. Jesus said, you call me Lord and Master, and I am. But if I'm your Lord and Master, wash your feet. You ought to wash one another's feet. And there's some people like Peter who said, Lord, don't you come near me. And he said, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have no Peter said, wash my head, my neck, my back, my toes, and everything. Y'all looking at me funny, and it gets real quiet when people start getting challenged on titles and stuff. And start getting, getting challenged on whether you serve or not. I tell our preachers, if you want to preach in the pulpit, clean it up first. Straighten it up. Volunteer. Do some things. Serve somebody. You've got to serve. We believe in servant leadership. For the greatest among you is the servant of all of you. For Christ himself did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom. You've got to empty yourself and you've got to humble yourself and be a servant. 
People ought to know you as a servant leader. Now, being a servant leader ain't being the pastor and mopping up the dining room after the saints have eaten that night and gone home and they're belching. That's not a servant. A servant is you giving to God your highest and best use. My highest and best use is teaching and preaching. That's why in Acts chapter 6, when they were dis disputing over the Grecians and the Jews about the food, and the, and the Jews were given to the Jewish women first and then given to the half-Jews or the Hellenistic Jews secondly, and, and, and the disputation, disputation came up, and they brought it to the apostles. And the apostles said, it is not right for us to leave the prayer and the preaching of the word to go and serve tables. It's not that they weren't servants, but they were called to preach and teach the gospel. And so they are better used, and their highest and best use is preaching and teaching. So he said, look out among you, find you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, bring them to us that we might put them over this matter, that they might be able to judge fairly, that they might be able to handle that business, because this is our business. Y'all y'all are slow, but y'all going to get it. In other words, it's not the preacher's job to prove to you that they're servants by going outside picking up paper in the yard when they need to be praying and seeking God for a word for you. Ah, it's your responsibility to give God, am I, am I in the right place? The highest and the back, I, I can't understand this. Y'all were shouting a little while ago and jumping up and down over ain't the God we serve all right. Well, you need to understand that you have a responsibility to God and it's not about a title, it's about a towel. And if you don't serve, you don't get nothing from God. <laughs> Tell somebody, serve somebody. <laughs> Number two, you got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're really going to do something for God, you better be led by the Spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So look at here. Josh, Deuteronomy 34, 9 says, let us know something about Joshua. Watch this. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the Spirit and wisdom. He was full of the Spirit and wisdom. He was a servant of Moses. Watch this. You're going to shout on this. He was full of the wisdom of God and full of the Spirit of God. Now what happened? That ain't what you're going to shout on. You're going to shout on this. Joshua served one man for 40 years. You ain't going to shout on that. A man so meek, he could go off at any time. The Bible called Moses the meekest man in the land, but he was a refugee for 40 years because he killed a man with his bare hands. <laughs> Homie had the potential to go off. You still don't get it. He didn't enter into the promised land because he didn't speak to the rock. He smoked the rock. <laughs> I'm talking about Moses. Moses said to God, kill these people. <laughs> the Bible calls him the meekest man. Y'all not getting this. In the land. Moses had a temper problem, but he was meek. And Joshua had to serve this dude with this kind of potential for 40 years. Joshua had to be filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're going to get that close to a leader and serve a leader and see the nakedness of a leader, if you're going to get that close to a leader and watch a leader sometimes have to prove to be human and deal with situations that you have to deal with yourself because when they were coming up out of Egypt, the people were like, Moses, with the God we had stayed in Egypt. Moses, you brought us out here to die. Moses, we are thirsty. Moses, we're tired of this manna. Moses, we want to go back. Moses turned around and said, hey, I'm hungry too. I'm thirsty too. I'm tired too. I want to go back too. Moses was in the thing with them. Moses was no different than them. Moses has got to deal with stuff. Moses got to handle certain things. So everybody who's going to serve Moses, you better be filled with the Holy Ghost and get your emotions off your sleeves and close one of your eyes if you have to. Oh, I'm preaching right there, right there. I wish I could say what I want to say. You got to be filled with the Holy Ghost if you're going to serve 
men of God. You got to have a spirit of the, the, Ham, the Hamites were the, were the forefathers of the Canaanites who don't even exist today. Because when Noah had landed the ark, a preacher of righteousness, a holy man of God, one of the three people that God named has been righteous before him. But after his success, he wound up planting a vineyard and he got drunk, drunk off of his success, drunk off of the thing that he prospered in. And he was butt naked in the house. And his son Ham, who was close to him, came in and saw him and ran out and told everybody that dad is in the house drunk and butt naked. Go and see him. But his two sons, Sham and Japheth, said, I dare not even look on the nakedness of my father. I've got an image of him, and he's been good to me, and he carried us on that ark, and he's preserved us, and it was through the water that we're saved, and my daddy preached righteousness for 120 years. He declared that it was going to rain, and it rained. Me and my family were saved. My children are saved today. We're blessed today because of my daddy. I don't even want to look on the nakedness of my daddy. The devil is a liar. And they walked in over him backwards, and they covered his nakedness. That's a real son. That's a real daughter. That's a real servant of the Most High God. I'm trying to help some of y'all here. And I tell pastors all over the country, some of us got these folk close to us, but there's some folk right on the outside that we need to bring in and some folk on the inside that we need to get rid of. I ask pastors all the time, let me, how many say, let me see the hands of pastors. Let me see the hands of pastors. If pastors, let me ask you a question. I want you to respond. If you were getting ready to start a new work, a new work, somewhere else in the country or even in another continent and you got people that are with you now that are getting on your last nerve would you have some people that are working on your staff right now that you know you definitely wouldn't take with you if that's you let me see your hand that you know you wouldn't take with you come on let me see your hand you're not you, are you kidding me are y'all hold your hand up let me see you wouldn't so why are they on your staff now See how quiet they get? They don't say nothing when you tell the truth, do they? That's the kind of people they are, that British influence. That's what it is. I just said, why are they on your staff now? And the rest of y'all should have said, amen. amen. We have people in our midst that we know will uncover our nakedness, create problems for us, cause division and confusion. It's like going on a church trip and that sister comes to get on the bus and you look at everybody and say, who invited her? I go and do TBN, and we'll ride down to Miami, and we got a bus, and everybody get on the bus. And when, I get, when they get down there, I'm already there. They fly me down. I'm already in the studios, TBN. I'm already there, the big place in Miami. And we're there, and then I come outside to greet the people. And when I come outside, people start getting off the bus. And I start looking at them and like, what? No, hey, how you doing? <laughs> I don't want no And then I call whoever's on the bus in charge of the bus and say, I told you to put them on that bus. What are they doing on that bus? <laughs> they don't get along with nobody. They don't like nobody. Popping their neck, chewing gum. They fix tuna fish sandwiches to go down there, smell up the whole bus. Number three, somebody has got to endorse you. Somebody's got to endorse you. Deuteronomy 34, 9, And Moses laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as Moses had commanded. And Moses did what the Lord commanded him. Who sent you? Who told you to do what you're doing? Here's how you're going to get your possession now. You've got to align yourself. You have to position yourself. You've got to, you've got to serve somebody. You've got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You've got to be endorsed. Who knows what you're doing? One of the worst things I have in my ministry is for somebody to feel underappreciated and overworked and then to go tell everybody, I do my job well. I do. How in the world can you say you do your job well when you're working for somebody else? Shouldn't I be the one that tell you whether you're doing a good job or not? And then there's so many people who are doing everybody else's job and they don't do what they're supposed to do. And they're overworked trying to do everything else when all they got to do is do what I asked them to do. 
Come on, am I preaching? Am I helping you, Bonnie? All they got to do is what I ask you to do. Just do what I ask you to do. And you won't be frustrated and irritated and mad. Okay, it's getting quiet. I'm just saying God has instructed me on the importance of impartation and endorsement. And I'm supposed to do this. I made this point tonight. I'm supposed to announce a jubilee tonight for somebody through proper alignment. When we get done with this message, I'm going to pronounce jubilee over people who check themselves on this list and properly align. And we're going to shout and see what God's going to do. The last point, number four, last but not least, be strong. Tell somebody, be strong. Back home, we call it scrong. Be strong. <laughs> you got to be strong. Ephesians 6, 10, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord. Josh 1, be of good courage. Finally, be strong. That is to become strong. Come on, help me. I'm going to close this. Become stable. Stop tripping. Become secure. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't draw back. Don't turn around. Let the trial make you better, not bitter. Try it again. Get up again. And Cain slew Abel. But Adam knew Eve again. Samson lost his power in the lap of Delilah, but his hair started growing back again. Elijah ran from Jezebel, but then prayed for rain and got it, and then was given a chariot ride home to glory. He went from depression to the mountaintop, from the mountaintop through the valley, running out, running a chariot by himself. David asked the Lord for another chance, and God gave it to him. And I want to say this to you. God's not the God of a second chance or third chance or fourth chance but God is the God of another chance and I know there's some people in here right now you need another chance if I were to give you this microphone you would tell us the hell you've been through and you would tell us how many times that you had a good face on in church but when you were home and you were out there in those streets you did some things that you dare not testify about but God is so merciful and so good and so loving and so kind that God covered you that God protected you you, that God kept you from embarrassment public embarrassment God kept you from anybody being able to discover what you were going through that would have discredited you in the house of God or in the ministry of Jesus Christ and for somebody in here you ought to thank God for that covering that he gives you and the privilege of privacy where he gives you an opportunity to get it right before he exposes you publicly so many of you have gone to your prayer closet right in the nick of time so many of you have had a Nathan that have walked up to you and said you know what you the man and nobody had to hear it from the pulpit and nobody had to hear it in the church house but God tenderly pulled you aside and said you're my child I love you but I don't need you acting like that I need you to get your act together so I'm giving you the privilege of privacy so now when you go to church on Sunday you can go in there and not fake it you can go in there for real because when you confess your sins he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and some of y'all need to learn this because the the devil is in some of your ear when you get down to pray. How many of you ever got down to pray and the devil told you, you ain't got no business down here talking to God. You know what you got in your life. You know what you're thinking right now. See how stupid the devil is and we're not ignorant of his devices. When you're down on your knees and you're praying and the devil start bringing stuff up that you did, start confessing that. And then every time he tell you something else, confess that too. And then when he gets quiet, say, why are you quiet now? Keep on telling me what I need to know because every time you tell me something, I'm going to tell God, and God is going to forgive me. So I want you to understand what God is doing. God's doing something in our lives that is really, really real. He's aligning us. Peter was sifted and cussing, but wound up being the keynote speaker on Pentecost. Fight back. That's what God's telling me to tell you. Fight back. Get up from where you are, because you need to be in position if you plan on possessing what it is that God has for you, because you need to be in the right place at the right time when the blessings start pouring when the power of God starts falling you cannot be out there acting like the fool that you can be if God doesn't quicken you and bring you to your senses so I want you to know I, God wants you to serve your community God wants you filled with the Holy Ghost God wants you endorsed by your leaders and God wants you to be strong now I need to take the test because some of y'all need to answer these questions for me to Tonight. And if you answer all four of these questions and if you answer them in the positive, then I want you to act like you don't have any.
any sense at all. I want you to shout and run and leap and jump like you believe Jesus is coming back tonight. So here's question number one. Are you serving anybody? If you're serving somebody, put your hands together. All right, hold on. Question number two. Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? That's all I want to know. Question number three. Has somebody endorsed your ministry? Does somebody know what you're doing? Got a little quiet. Question number four. Are you strong in the Lord and in the power of his wife? Well, if you're serving somebody and if you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you're endorsed by your leaders and you're strong in the Lord, why don't you right now thank God because you are positioned to receive the promise. Ah, E flat, E flat, E flat, E flat, E flat. The promise.